So, all right. Well, uh, today I'm privileged to be having a conversation with Rabbi Eric Linder. Uh, Hi, everyone. I, uh, Congregation Children of Israel, right around the corner from Holy Cross. And uh, this Advent season uh, at Holy Cross, we're talking about Mary, the mother of Jesus. And so I wanted to set up conversations with a New Testament scholar, with a Catholic. And uh, and I thought it would be really interesting to include the perspective of a rabbi so we can get a better sense of Mary's Jewish identity and uh, how that helps us better understand both her and the ministry of Jesus. And so thanks for, for joining us today. My Rabbi. pleasure. Thank you. Yeah. So uh, I, I, I sent you a bunch of questions and, you know, I figure we'll walk through those and feel free to give me any pushback you want on those. Sure. Um, so um, my first question um, is, can you help us to better understand um, Judaism from around the time of, of Jesus and Mary and how Judaism has changed and developed since then. Because I think a lot of Christians make assumptions about Judaism based on what we read in the New Testament. But there's sure, a- And vice versa, by the way. You're, yeah. You're, you're, no one religion has any claim to, to making uh, incorrect assumptions by any means. Um, so sure, I'm, I'm happy to try. Um, you know, as as we talked about uh, when we had coffee, we do see each other uh, IRL, as the kids say, in real life. It, it, thank goodness. Yeah, yeah, right. right. Given the proximity of how close our, our two places of worship are. Um, you know, Mary is not something that Judaism, um, you know, puts a lot of... I, importance isn't quite the right word but frankly we just don't learn a lot about her and so it's not even it's not only a question of here is an area where our religions are different in terms of belief so you know jesus would be like the easy one right like you believe in jesus as christ and we don't that is a difference but it also pinpoints kind of where our different priorities are and what we focus on um but your question is absolutely something focused on, namely uh, first century Judaism. And one thing that is really interesting about the kind of commingling of when Mary was alive and what was happening in Judaism is it was just at the end of what we call the second temple period. So you know, I tell Jews in my congregation, and, and if I may be so bold, I'll tell your parishioners as well. In terms of Judaism, there is one date that everyone should know, and that date is the year 70. So in the year 70, that was when the temple was destroyed. And what makes this so important and really a watershed moment for Judaism is that prior to the year 70, there were things that were done at the temple, capital T temple in Jerusalem that were not done anywhere else. So for example, the sacrifice of animals was only done at the temple. That never was a home ritual, thank God. Yeah. Um, and that's, that's where people would go to kind of get that ritual, right? Um, Yom Kippur, when the um, the priest opened the Holy of Holies, the Ark, uh, that would only happen at the temple. And so there were various things that, you know, the, when I talk to kids about it, I'm like, that's how they express their Judaism. When the temple was destroyed, all of those things were, were, were gone and you weren't able to do them anymore. And so I didn't come up with this expression, but an author came up with the, this idea that Judaism experienced a paradigm shift where it became portable. And mm -hmm. this is where we get what we call the diaspora, Jews living outside of Israel. And of course, that counts Athens, Georgia. And so it's not that what we did in the temple are things we do now in our synagogues, but they morphed. So, so prayer took a much higher place in what a service or ritual looks like. And obviously, you know, you, even if you've never been to our synagogue, you probably know we do not, again, thankfully, sacrifice animals. It, it, the cleaning bill would be just, you know, way too much. Sure, yeah. <laughs> so it really was a, a period of change of Jews kind of 
figuring out how do we maintain our Jewish identity, um, you know, in in the in the wake of this destruction. Now, again, that was 70. So, you know, Mary was a little earlier than that. Um, but in those, I would say, 100 years before then, that's kind of this transition period. I mean, you know, Jews I saw kind of the writing on the wall, as it were. Um, and one of our holy texts, so I'm, I'm guessing everyone has heard of the Torah, um, but one of our holy texts is called the Mishnah, which was compiled in the year 200. And so all of these things around the same time really morphed Judaism, not necessarily into what it is today, because it's not like we follow, you know, you know, I mean, the, Mish the Mishnah talks about things like, you know, Nathan, if, if you and I were at the market and my ox gored your ox, how many shekels would I owe you? But the, the methodology behind it and the logic and argumentation is something I would say Judaism still uses today. So that, that's a very long answer um, to a kind of a generalization of, of what was happening, you know, around that time. Right, right. No, and that's super helpful. That's super helpful. And, um, you know, people who study the history of Christianity too, you know, also sort of uh, attach a lot of significance to the destruction of the temple. And Absolutely. probably most of the New Testament books were written after the destruction of the temple because you see those kind of retrojected into the Gospels. Exactly. You know, and, and one other thing I think that's important, too, um, that, you know, when anyone really thinks about it, it, it's obvious. But the influence into Judaism from the prevailing Hellenistic culture. So, you know, many people if you've not been to a Passover Seder, I mean, many people know what Passover looks like. The way that we, when I say we, Jews, generally celebrate Passover is really modeled after a Greek symposium. Huh. You know, and, and so what, what the Torah says about Passover is, is other than the fact that we celebrate freedom from Egypt and matzahs involved, you know, the, the the actual Seder itself is so far removed from that. And it's such an invention of the rabbis during the rabbinic period, which, of course, came after the destruction of the temple. And so all of those ideas, you know, and it's also a reason why Greek, the language, is so important for both uh, Christians and Jews because of that Hellenistic, um, it, you know, it was just so rich in the religious culture. Right, right, right. Yeah, and one of the things that I really learned in seminary was uh, just the <clears throat> the complete inability to understand Jesus and his ministry independently of what was happening in Judaism around that time. And so yeah. I imagine, you know, that uh, that Jesus' critique of the temple practices. You know, you hear all the stories about Jesus turning the money changers out um, and purifying the temple. Um, uh, you know, that there were a lot of other people who were doing similar things in the Jewish world. Right. And, and I and I think you might get to this in, in other questions, but this also um, bears. Uh, you're going to have to edit this out. Not importance. What's the word? Bears mentioning. So let me just I'll start over. So your editing isn't. So one thing that this reminds me of that Bear is mentioning and, and we may come back to is, you know, you talked about assumptions. I think sometimes when we study history, we think of things as, you know, a monolithic entity. And I, and I apologize for my dog. If she keeps going, she will she will be relegated to the basement. Um, but within Judaism during this time, there wasn't necessarily a uniform way of doing things. In fact, um, you know, there were different it wasn't quite sects of Judaism, but certainly different um, communities with varying beliefs. And so, you know, you have, uh, I'm, I know you have, Nathan, but, you know, your parishioners may have heard of the Pharisees and Sadducees and how, you know, they butted heads and not only had different theological beliefs, but political beliefs and different kind of socioeconomic backgrounds. And, you know, that 
fed into into the time period because how could it not right 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 yeah and i mean among christians pharisee is sort of a you know a term of insult you know but preach about the pharisees i try to say you know they agreed with jesus on like 95 percent of the things that they were talking about you know the one thing that they disagreed with was the nature of jesus identity you know and obviously like that's a big disagreement but we forget that all the things they had in common you know right important that's important um one of the things that I wanted to ask you about has to do with the sort of changing roles of women in Judaism and in Christianity and just in the modern world. And I'm sure that people in both our congregations, you know, celebrate those changes um, where they've been positive and given more freedom and dignity to women. Um, and as a result of some of those changes, we've been all driven back to um, stories about women in scripture, um, you know, Protestants and for Catholics, you know, we've sort of gone back to Mary and focused on her and her role. Um, but what would you want to say about, uh, you know, women in scripture for Jews and the how, how that helps shape the role of women in Judaism today? Sure. And, you know, like in other aspects of our society, I mean, this is a huge topic, not just in Judaism, but, you know, everywhere. Um but traditionally speaking, um, you know, it's interesting because Jewish identity from when I say the word halakha, that means Jewish law. So halakhically speaking, one's Jewish identity comes from the mother. Right. So, you know, Mary was Jewish. Therefore, Jesus was Jewish. In my tradition of reform Judaism, we support what we call patrilineal descent, which is where, you know, I think it speaks for itself. But if a father is Jewish and the mother is not Jewish. And, and, you know, the and is important. The child is raised Jewishly and not, you know, anything else and identifies as a Jew. That person is considered as Jewish as me, whose mother was Jewish. Right. So so th that that's kind of a definitional um, one way that women. I don't know if we'd say had power, but certainly, you know, we follow, like I said, the, the women's li lineage. Um, you know, traditionally speaking, and this is true today with with traditional Jews and, you know, certainly Orthodox Jews, and is that the men lead prayer, study Torah, chant Torah, and the women are much more concerned with kind of house and family. And one way. So, again, from a from a legalistic point of view, a woman, for example, can't chant Torah in front of the congregation. Um I mean, the reasons of which are varied and it has to do with like a woman's voice is so sexy. A man won't be able to to concentrate. I mean, it's so horrible um, yeah. and not, you know, not who we are as my congregation. But again, in the first century, this would have been the case. Um, it's also the case that so, you know, we have 613 what we call meets votes, commandments. And they're, they're divided up in a number of different ways, positive and negative. So, you know, positive is thou shall, like observe the Sabbath day and keep it holy is a positive commandment. Thou shall not murder negative commandment. Women are exempt, this may be confusing for a second, from following positive time-bound commandments. So in other words, uh, I'll give you a, an example. In the mornings, men are supposed to wrap, put around their um, wrists and their forehead. You may have seen what we call tefillin, the leather phylacteries that some Jews wear in the mornings. Women do not do those. And, you know, exempt is kind of a, um, a tricky word because not only are they, do they not have to do them, they aren't allowed to do them according to, to you know, traditional Judaism. And that's where I would say we disagree. Because, you know, in Reform Judaism, we would say, well, no one really has to do that specific mitzvah. Um, it's, it's a personal choice. But there's no separation of rights and responsibility based on gender. Um, right. Now, that's far removed from the first century. So I apologize. I don't know, but it's significant. It, uh, you know, it reflects the question for sure. Yeah. Um, you know, it's a it's a strange thing in some ways to talk about, because what we understand 
as feminism and human, not human rights, but a, a lot of the things that, that for us is common sense to a certain degree. You know, we're coming at it with our mindset of, you know, 20 and 21st century life, mm -hmm. um, which, you know, which makes it kind of complicated. Uh, but I, but that's that's kind of the world in terms of you know very clear distinction. Mm -hmm. um, one thing that's that I always thought was interesting is so you know there's 613 mitzvot and the way this was explained to me once is the mitzvah to have children to be fruitful and multiply is so great that it outweighs the others and so because a woman can do that you know can carry a baby to term and 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 deliver a baby that kind of, you know, if it's a scale, it outweighs the others. And so you don't need to study Torah. You can have babies, you know, that sort of thing. Yeah. As you all in Judaism have kind of wrestled with these questions, are there any, you know, sort of touchstones or figures in scripture that have figured prominently or yeah, yeah. Uh, so uh, I always pronounce this wrong. Zalafafed, the Zalafafed's daughters. So in the Torah, um, and it, it's kind of a, a little story. Um, I want to say it's Deuteronomy. Do you know offhand, Nathan? Not offhand, no. But yeah. Um, that's what the internet's for, right? We can, uh, uh, yeah. <laughs> but there's this great story where Moses, you know, Moses is now in charge. It's it's definitely Leviticus or later because Moses is in charge and is kind of adjudicating, you know, different disputes. And these three women come up to him because their father has died and they didn't leave. They didn't have any um, brothers. And so the question is, who's the land going to go to? Because women aren't allowed to own land. But Moses um, says that they can have the land. And so it's the first example in the Torah where kind of women or one of the first certainly where women are explicitly standing up for kind of their rights as women and as landowners and win. So it, it's that's absolutely a story we look to. Yeah. Which goes that's back, by the way, to my previous how we started about priorities. I, I think about this stuff a lot because if if feminism and kind of equal rights for gender and sexual identity weren't important to us, most people wouldn't know that story. You know, it's like we know the story because of who we are, not because of what the story is in some ways. Right, right, right. Yeah. And I mean, that's always a fascinating question for anybody who has a sort of revealed idea about religion. Um, you know, who's who's leading the culture or the, you know. The revelation, you know, and I mean, it's always a complicated interplay, right? Oh, absolutely. I, I tell my congregants this all the time. And again, it, I didn't make it up, sadly. One of my teachers used to use the phrase, theology is autobiography. Uh -huh. Like you can't talk about God or, you know, and you mentioned this in a different way. You, you can't talk about Mary without understanding the context of which she lived. Like one's autobiographical life matters. It's not just kind of in an intellectual ether that exists outside of, you know, the muddiness of our lives. Right, right, right. Numbers, yeah. numbers is a laugh of it. Okay, okay. Yeah, yeah. And I mean, that's kind of the beautiful thing about certainly Judaism and Christianity. And you could say something analogous about Islam, too, is that, you know, God has entered in, into history and, you know, wants to interact with concrete historical people and events. Uh, um, yes, absolutely. And that's very, I, yeah, I, I think that's very much true for both of us, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Um, I don't mean like our own, like both of our religions. Right. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, so one of the things that I wanted to ask you about also was um, there's some really interesting parallels between the Magnificat, Mary's song in the first chapter of Luke, and uh, Hannah's song, Hannah, the mother of Samuel um, in, in 1 Samuel 2. Um, and I wonder if, um, you know, there are things that we could learn about Mary, you know, uh, in the role of other women based on Hannah and, you know, other forebears of Mary in scripture, if that makes sense. 
It, I think so. I mean, I certainly can speak a little more to Hannah than than Mary, but I, you know, I think again for good or bad, women. Well, no, I could say for bad. <laughs> I think <laughs> women's success was viewed by kind of can they not only have children but sons you know and i one of the prime examples of this is when jacob you know jacob at first marries leah because he's tricked by his uncle levon he wants to marry marry rachel and eventually he does have kind of have both of them but leah's the one that gives him sons and she names her sons as almost this way of Jacob paying attention to her. So like Reuven literally means, look, a son. Like, hey man, I gave you a son. She did it. Why don't you love me? And of course, Hannah's prayer, um, you know, it, it is similar here. Um, one of the things I find powerful about this is it shows, I mean, we use it, or I use this in a little bit of a different context, mm -hmm. which is, Spot the the role of heartfelt spontaneous prayer. Mm -hmm. you know, people, I think Jews included, see Judaism not as rigid, but in terms of the prayer, somewhat rigid. So, like you know, if you came to a Shabbat service, which anyone in your congregation is always welcome to do, you know, I mean, the the service is essentially the same every Friday night. We may have a different tune for a prayer and different readings. But there is a set order of prayer, and it's meant to go kind of an ebb and flow and a climax with the reading of the Torah, et cetera. And that's great, but there's not a lot of space for personal reflective prayer. And that's one of the things that I think Hannah shows us. Yeah, yeah. No, that's fantastic. I really uh, I appreciate that. And, you know, as Lutherans, we're sort of on the spectrum of Christian churches, you know, between like more charismatic freeform worship and liturgical worship we're you know, we tend to be at the liturgical end of the spectrum. And so, you know, our people are petrified anytime you ask them to like spontaneously pray in public for the most right. part, you know, there are exceptions, but uh, you know, I try to tell people like, that's not, uh, that's, you know, I guess that's nothing to be ashamed of, but we should be able to freely speak to God. You know, God Absolutely. Will be with us and to hear from us. Um, what, what did you say the the poem or song was called? Mary's the Magnificat. Yeah, it's Latin for uh, my my soul magnifies the Lord. Got it. And what what was the kind of essence of of that poem? It's almost. It's almost. Uh, I wouldn't say word for word, but if you compare the two texts. Uh, the Magnificat was obviously inspired by the song of Hannah. Yeah, all about God's um, lifting oh, up the holy and, uh, uh, you know, casting down the mighty. Um, so some of this is some of this is not surprisingly, but uh, biblical imagery that we so I, I looked it up while you were talking. <laughs> um, yeah. God has performed mighty deeds with God's arm. I mean, that is something we say word for word during Passover. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And was yeah. this before having Jesus that she did said this? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, so Luke talks about how the angel Gabriel came to Mary and said, uh, greetings, highly favored. Uh, the Lord is with you. Um, and, and uh, uh, Gabriel and Mary have this interchange and Gabriel says, you know, you will bear the Messiah. And uh, and Mary consents to that and then sings the Magnificat. So, uh, you know, and you can see a lot of the parallels with uh, with Hannah and uh, and Samuel. So. So, oh, yeah, yeah. But it's an interesting mean, sort yeah. of, uh, you know, to hone in on the, the nature of spontaneous prayer, you know, because there is this kind of like overflowing joy for Mary. And I mean, to me, that like speaks to the fact that Mary is not completely passive. You know, she uh, like, nice. wants to play this role and, um, you know, see something she can contribute, you know, to God's plan. So, sure. yeah, yeah, it's interesting. Um, so, you know, as 
uh, you know, a Lutheran and a, a rabbi talk to each other, um, what are some ways that you think, um, you know, even though we have disagreements as, as Jews and Christians, how can we grow in our understanding and our common life together, uh, especially yeah. in light of all the terrible things that are happening in the world and in the shadow of the Holocaust, you know? Yeah. And, and you know, again, going back to the theology as autobiography, it, it's so needed today. I mean, I, I don't know. Yeah. I, 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 yes, in the shadow of the Holocaust, absolutely. But like since October 7th, yeah. where, you know, Jews around the country and around the world are being vilified, there's been violence against Muslims. Like it, it, it is horrible. And we live in a world where th there's this necessity to be right, I feel like. And, and that my religion isn't good enough unless, you know, I make you feel awful about yours or I tell you you're wrong. And that's just not the kind of religion I want to be a part of and certainly not the kind of God I want to pray to, you know, a God that will punish others that don't believe the, the same way I do. So, you know, anything that builds relationships and, a you know, you could have a relationship with someone you disagree with, <laughs> but, um, but she, my dog's agreeing with us. I'd say, too, it, it is these types of things don't have to be explicitly religious. I mean, I, I remember it was several years ago now, but when um, folks from my synagogue and, and your church helped um, clean your the beautiful cemetery right next to your church. Right. Like that, that wasn't a religious sure. experience event i mean it was important and wonderful and what we would call tikkun olam the repair of the world um but it wasn't like a sit down let's learn about each other's religion but when when we come into contact with people different than us that is just a good thing i i believe that in the core of my my being yeah yeah absolutely well and i i mean you know that's one of the things that i like about the interfaith clergy partnership most of the time we're just fellowshipping and talking about matters that are just sort of common good things for the community, you know? That's right. Um, and, you know, we can talk about our faith, but, you know, we're not there to, like, hammer out perfect agreement. <laughs> That's right. That's right. And, and, yeah. And as if that was even possible, too. It's like, sure, sure. And well, and I mean, I would, I would guess that, you know, if you got a big group of rabbis and a big group of pastors there would be things that you and I would be closer on religiously. Oh, we would with our colleagues. <laughs> no, no, 100%. It's not even a question. Yeah. Um, certainly with regard to, you know, like um, equality and human. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we, there's this joke, and again, not exclusive to, to Judaism, but, you know, when, when there's two Jews in the room, there's three opinions. So it's not like... You know, perfect agreement is not the goal. The goal is is holiness and and growth and learning. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Well, I'm so grateful to you for uh, for taking the time to have this conversation. And uh, well, thank you. I, I again really, soon. Yeah, I learned I learned a little bit about Mary, which I appreciate. So thanks, Nathan.